Let's close our eyes for prayer. While you bow your head and your eyes are closed, remember the call upon your life. And that call involves the cross. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. Take up your cross every day. Don't be ashamed to say that you know him. Count the cost, the great cost of preaching the gospel. It's not going to be an easy road. Count the cost. It's going to take you something. Count the cost. Take up your cross. Follow him. That's the only way you are going to be successful in ministry. Every day, every day. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Take up your cross every day. Don't cringe. Don't complain. Don't be a coward. Don't run away from the battlefield. Take up that cross every day. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed to say anywhere that you know him, that you serve him, that you bear up the standard. Count the cost. Take up the cross. Look at him in front of you. He's taking the cross and he's going to Calvary. And he's falling beneath the heavy load of that cross. Look at the women weeping for him while he bore the cross. Look at him as he stretched his hand. And they nailed him to that cross and they lifted him up for the world to see. And he shouted, come down from that cross and I will believe you. And he stayed there on that cross. Take up that cross. Follow him. Our Father, we thank you very much today. We bless your name because you promised us a crown, but it's after the cross. And Lord, we pray as we have responded to the call that we're going to preach the gospel. Help us, Lord, always to remember, every day to remember that it will not be an easy road. There is a cross for us to pick up, pick, take up and bear all along the journey in preaching, in praying, in organizing, in practicing everything that we do. There's going to be a cross every turn of the way, every day of, of our lives. And therefore, Lord, we pray that this very morning, you give us the courage to take up our cross and to follow you in Jesus' name. We will not be afraid. We will not be ashamed. We're going to follow you to the very end of the journey in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to understand that the ministry is not for cowards. The ministry is not for those who are looking for easy life. The ministry is not for compromisers. The ministry is not for novices, unexperienced, unskillful people who just want to have a nice time. You've called us into the battlefield to fight the good fight of faith. To lay hold on life eternal. And to war a good warfare. And to wrestle with principalities and powers. You've called us so that we'll be able to do this work and lift up a standard. Let the world see who the Savior is. Let the world see the power of that Savior to change and transform their lives. And prepare them for heaven. Lord, we pray as we come to this final message. Anything we still need. Inject it into us in Jesus' name. Make us the kind of ministers we ought to be. Ministers of conviction. Ministers of courage. Ministers of character. Ministers with no compromise. Ministers that set their face on the goal. 
And no matter the lion, the bear, the principalities, the powers on the way, they keep on marching until they get to the place they ought to go. No retreat. No regret. No return. We're going to keep on preaching, keep on praying, keep on serving, keep on ministering, keep on holding those crusades, and keep on pastoring those churches until the last breath in our body in Jesus' name. We'll do the work you have appointed us to do. Lord, here we are. Strengthen us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Praise the Lord. We come to the climax, the conclusion, the consummation of uh, the conference that the Lord brought us together to have at this time. And we thank the Lord for, uh, from the very first night, the Lord has been speaking to us. And here we are coming now to finalize everything, conclude everything. And we're in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Everybody shout, Amen. Amen. Christ said, I will build my church. And he said, no matter the forces of evil, the prince of darkness, the god of this world, no matter any of those demons in their conspiracy out of the pit of hell, they may even carry the very authority of hell. Because, you know, the magistrates in those days, they were at the gate of the city and they judged everything. They made their decisions and they made their verdicts at the gate of the city. And uh, the gate of the city then came to represent the authority and the power, the judgment and the verdict of the judges and of the magistrates in the city. And when Jesus said, the gates of hell, it means the power of hell, the authority of hell. And all those cohorts of the devil, together with the devil, making a decision that the church will not stand. He says, those authorities from hell shall not prevail against the church. Christ promised that he was going to build a church. A church that cannot be overcome. A church that cannot be overpowered by the forces of evil. The conquering Christ promised to build a church that cannot be conquered. Christ who bruised the head of the old serpent is building a church against which the very gates of hell, the power of hell cannot prevail against. Christ himself is the foundation of the church. Not Peter, not Peter. Peter just made a confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then, upon this rock, that statement of truth, Upon who Christ is, the very Son of God. Upon that rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. Uh, for you to understand, that, that foundation, that rock, is not built about Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Reading there from... Verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace 
of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For all the foundation, like Peter, all the foundation, like St. Mary, all the foundation, like St. Augustine, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Which is, what's the name? Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. Therefore, we understand when Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's a rock of ages. You sing it in your church. Clap for me. Let me hide myself in the, you are not hiding yourself in Peter. Let the water and the blood from the river side with flood be of sin the double kill. Tensing me from the, the very pollution of sin, the stain of sin. And you know what Peter himself said? Concerning Jesus, he said, There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. One name, the name is Jesus. You know what Peter said in the epistle? He also has lively stones, a built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And he says, wherefore, also, it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Peter knew he wasn't, he wasn't the cornerstone. He referred to Jesus himself, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And that's what Peter said. Did you hear that song? The warnings when we sang. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She, the church, is his new creation. By water and the word from heaven. He came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her. And for life, he died. The foundation is Christ. We have it in song. We have it in scripture. Christ is the architect, the builder, the owner, the Lord of the church. He said, I will build my church. That's why the scripture says, Take it therefore unto yourselves to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's why it says in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for that church, that he might sanctify. And cleanse it or the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot. Or wrinkle. Or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what church. If you understand. The word church is in the Greek ecclesia. And in the passage I read to you. Matthew chapter 16. That's the very first place. That word church, ecclesia, was used in the New Testament. And it's the assembly of redeemed, purchased, forgiven, called out ones. Ecclesia, called the called out ones. And that church of cleansed, forgiven, called out ones, that church is invincible unconquerable that even the very gates of hell shall not cannot prevail against it cannot overpower it cannot overthrow it cannot overcome it that's what we are talking about now building with Christ Christ is really the builder but he calls us as instruments, as tools in his hand. So that with him, we can join together and build. And we're ready together. Didn't you hear? For we 
and labor us together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. As we look at the building of the church, we see Christ building the church. And we ministers are involved in the building of that church. And let's look at three things. Number one, the plan and the purpose of Christ the builder. The plan and the purpose of Christ the builder. Number two, partnership with and power from Christ the builder. Partnership and power. On the one hand, partnership with Christ. On the other hand, power with Christ the builder. Partnership with and power from Christ the builder. Number three, protection and preservation of Christ's church, the building. Protection and preservation of Christ's church, the building. Number one, the plan and the purpose of Christ, the builder. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I have a plan. And there's a purpose to that plan. And when he says, I have a plan, he announced the plan that he had. What's the plan? Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. I need to tell you something about the plan. When God makes a plan, God's plan can never be frustrated by Satan and all his agents altogether. God's plan, note it, can never be frustrated by Satan and all his agents. And Christ is God. Christ's plan, therefore, can never be frustrated by the forces of evil. In any generation, in every generation, in all the generations combined together, Christ's plan can never be frustrated by all the forces of evil combined together in all the generations of the world. Psalm 33. Verse 11. Psalm 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord. The plan of the Lord. The desire of the Lord. The decision of the Lord. Shall stand. It standeth forever. The thought of his heart to all generations. That's what I told you. That the plan of God. Once Christ plans something. And Christ is God. Christ is God. He is the Lord. The Lord plans something. The plan of the Lord can never be frustrated. And that's, what, that's why Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, there in verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Did you hear the word that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ? Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So shall my word be. That goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. In Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. There in verse 30. There is no wisdom. No understanding. No counsel against the Lord. Once Christ plans anything. Once God plans anything. Once God declares that this is what he is going to do. There is no power. There is no wisdom. There is no plan. There is no plot of the devil. That can go against Fight against that plan of the Lord and then frustrate it. For there is no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. That means then it's easier 
for heaven and earth to pass away than for the church to be conquered. Easier for heaven and earth to pass away. For the sun to miss its orbit and for the stars to fall. It's easier for the oceans to dry up, all the oceans of the world, for it to dry up than for the church to be conquered. Because in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You remember the word we're considering now? Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But that word of Jesus Christ shall never, never pass away. That means then, Christ has a plan. And that plan is going to be effected. It's going to be realized. And aren't you happy that you are part of a plan? That the combination of all the cause and all the agents of Satan on earth, in hell, in the sky, anywhere, they're not strong enough to frustrate the plan of the Almighty God. But uh, there is a purpose as well. What's the purpose? In building the church, uh, you need to understand that Christ had a purpose when he said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 15. Acts 15. From verse 14. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Do you understand that? Do you understand that Christ's purpose is not to convert the whole world? Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. Why did God visit the Gentiles? Not to convert all the Gentiles. Not to change the politics in the nations of the Gentiles. It's not to improve the marketing and commercial system of the Gentiles. The purpose of the Lord is not to overhaul all the system of the world. How many times pastors will leave the purpose of Christ? Building the church. Building the church. They will leave that and get involved in social things. And they want the whole world to go this direction. Let's address this problem of poverty in this continent. So that in every country, there will be no poverty anymore. Is that the purpose of Christ? Look at it in verse 14. To take out of them a people for his name. We're not going out there to change the world, whitewash the world, change their politics, do anything over there. We're to preach the gospel. And those who repent, they are being called out. Called out is taking out a people from among them for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof. And I will set it up that the residue of men, remainder of men, might seek after the Lord 
and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who doeth all these things. Then in verse 18, known unto God all his works from the beginning of the world. Known unto God all his works from the beginning of the world. Nothing takes God by surprise. If the church is going through persecution, it doesn't take God by surprise. If there is any storm, it doesn't take God by surprise. Known unto God are all his works. Whatever is happening today to you or to your church or to your ministry or to that um, local locality where you are, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knew about it. That's why all things work together for good. For them that are called of God, for them that are called according to his purpose, those who love the Lord. In First Peter chapter 2, the purpose, the purpose, why Christ is building the church. First Peter chapter 2, reading there in verse 5, verse 9, and verse 10. In verse 5 it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Do you see it here? Hey, look up for a minute. If you have a site where we ought to build a house and somebody is bringing blocks, bringing blocks, piling the blocks up, he never builds, he never builds, he never uses cement and attach those blocks together. Raise up an edifice. Raise up a building. Raise up a house. He has not built any house. Many blocks there. And they are not evangelists. They just preach. And they supply blocks, living stones. And their message, their ministry will not unite the stones together and build a spiritual house. And there are many people that are saying, I don't care whether they are integrated to the church or not. I don't care whether they are part of the church or not. God has sent me to evangelize. I'm evangelizing. I go to that village. I declare the word of God. And you know, many people came to know the Lord. I don't care to get their names. I don't care to baptize them in water. I don't care to form any church. If you know, they're all there. I praise the Lord. Thousands, millions are giving themselves to the Lord. My friend, that's not the purpose of Christ. Check up. From the very day of Pentecost, and Peter preached, and then 3,000 came to know the Lord. It says that they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. They were built up together. And then in the last verse of that chapter, it said, All those who are being saved, they were being added to the church. Uh, you know, many people might see somebody that comes and, you know, he says, I add. 100,000, 200,000 in that meeting. And I preach. And then you will leave the church where you are. You don't know the purpose of Christ in building the church. You will leave the church where you are. And then you also want crowd. That's, that's not the purpose. That's not the plan. Ye also, believers, as lively stones are built up, built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In verse 9, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Stop right there. How dare you say you're a minister, you're a pastor, over a church? And you say, see, church, in this our church, we're not, every church has its own emphasis. Deeper life, they have their emphasis. Pentecostal churches, they have their emphasis. Evangelical churches, they have their emphasis. New generation church, we have our emphasis. Let me tell you, point blank. Our emphasis, that's what they say, 
Our emphasis is not holiness. If you are looking for holiness, you know where they, they preach holiness? Don't bother us here. Don't disturb us here. Go, go, go. Don't disturb us. Don't cause confusion here. Our emphasis here, the joy of the Lord. To rejoice. If you have a demon and you are sad and you are not happy, you cannot dance, you cannot rejoice. Our emphasis says praise, joy. Sing and dance to the Lord. Let your feet dance. Let your hands dance. Let your head dance. Let your intestine, everything inside you, let everything dance. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh, you are there. Our emphasis here, holiness, holiness. If you are looking for holiness, you go to the places where they are preaching holiness. My friend, you miss the point of your call. The purpose of Christ. The purpose of Christ. Look at it. Ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. A peculiar people. Are they not people? They don't understand. They say you know. Immediately you see somebody coming from deeper life. You say that's deeper life. And, and they say you know why? Because they are peculiar. You know, they say it's not good to be peculiar. Therefore, just dress like them, talk like them, deck yourself with ornaments like them, so that you will not be peculiar. They say it's not good, you know, there's somebody going on the street and it's so peculiar that somebody, uh, that, that one is deeper life, that one is this, that one. Don't be peculiar. Why are you not going to be peculiar? That's the very purpose of the church. A peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's the purpose of Christ in, in having the church. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 verse 28. Acts. 20, 28. Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. It is the Holy Ghost that made you overseers? Well, he might, he might use, uh, you know, a person like me standing up here, not taller than this, because you know he uses the foolish things of the world. To confound the wise and the base things of the world to confound those who are mighty. And he chooses the people that nothing is in themselves so that he can confound the things that be. He can use the non entity here. He is the one doing it. I'm not really the one. I'm just his mouth. I'm just his feet. I'm just his hands. I'm just his voice. It's the Holy Ghost that has put you there. Be faithful. And you will not say, I'm not part of deeper life. And so what? Today is the name deeper life in heaven. When we get to heaven, are they going to say, are you deeper life coming? Are you another name? Go out. No. It's not deeper life. When did deeper life begin? This Bible was written before deeper life began. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Whether you are deeper life or not deeper life, you understand the Holy Ghost laid hands on you. And even though you are not sufficient by yourself, and even though you are not qualified by yourself, he laid hands on you. And then he puts you there. Then it says to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. When you think of the cost, that the Lord Jesus Christ expended his very blood so as to raise up the church. You want to understand that you'll do your very best and feed the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. Point number two. Partnership with and power from Christ the builder. To do this work we need his power. And we need to remain in partnership with him. If we are going to do the work successfully. In Matthew chapter 16 once again. Matthew chapter 16. We are coupling together. We are joining together. 
verses 18 and 19. And I say also unto you, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then in verse 19, and I will give unto thee. Of course, he was going away. Lord Jesus, is this a mystery? You are going to build the church, and the church is still going to be on the earth, but you are now telling us you'll be going away. How are you going to build the church when all the lifeless stones you are going to collect to build that church, a spiritual house, they are down here, and you will be up there. Then he showed them the secret. I'm doing it in partnership with you. And I'm transferring the power to get it done. I'm transferring it to you. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. Listen, listen. Get this, get this. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. How? You are on earth. You are my fellow laborers. I am the chief shepherd. You are the under shepherd. I am the chief builder. You are the builders walking along with me. You are here on earth. I am there in heaven. Every time you preach, we're together. Partnership and power. Every time you pray, we're together. Partnership and power. Every time you minister, we're together. Partnership and power. Here you are on earth. There I am in heaven. And we're in the process of building the church together. Whatsoever you bind on earth, I'll be over there. I'll bind it immediately in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, I'll be over there in heaven. I'll lose it in heaven. And you know, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Matthew, Philip, the rest of you that you know, any time I bind anything, since you've been following me, was there any stubborn devil that could hinder, that could stop, that could resist my word? No, master. Aha. Uh -huh. You know that if in the days of my flesh, anything I bound over here was bound, I bound in my glorified state up in heavens. Far above principalities and powers. I'm going to be there. And I'm going to be walking every day with you. And I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keep on binding. I'll bind it over there. You know, I need to tell you again. The reason I tell you this is because I believe that some imposters, some deceivers are cheating us. And they don't make us understand that it's not our power, it's not our words, it's not our speaking in tongues, it's not our vocabulary, it's not a prayer book, it's not, you know, how we stand, it's not even how we shout. It's the authority that is there, seated up above, on the right hand of majesty on high. That's the thing. As he sent this little me to any place, anywhere, and the people from Cote d'Ivoire, they are here. You understand what I'm going to say? It's not me. And we were having this meeting in Yopoga, that's seen in Cote d'Ivoire. And this fellow came in, real, real, real devil possessed fellow. And he had a spiritual tiger. That anywhere he went, he just commands that tiger, sends the tiger out to, you know, do the destructive work. And I was there, I was having the meeting. That night I came in. When I came in, I had not even started preaching. I, I sat down on the platform, and it's not a large auditorium like this, so the seat on the platform was very near to the front line. 
And then I, I ran my eyes across the auditorium. And then on the third or fourth row, I looked and I fixed my eyes there. And as I did that, I, I didn't even say anything. One person there became agitated. I became, I wasn't preaching. I wasn't praying. Just sitting on there, just, just, just looking. And then she became so agitated, became, began to shout. I asked the pastor, I said, do they do that in the church like this here? He said, never, that it has never happened, that we don't understand. Then I understood. And they carried out that person to go and pray for him. And then, at the end, well, I then came to preach. Not me, not me, not me. It's a key. Uh, look at that driver. Enters into the car, that big trailer. And then he sits down there, puts in the key, and he thinks that, look at that small man, thinner than I am, shorter than I am, not as educated as I am. See him driving that big trailer. It's not him, it's the key. Driving out demons, it's not you, it's the key. Biding that thing, losing that thing, it's not you, it's the key. And then after the message that night, and I began to pray, and I took authority. I said, that evil spirit in that anywhere I stand as an ambassador of the Almighty. I stand there and represent him. That thing, get out in Jesus' name. And that man, he didn't know when he closed his eyes. He didn't know when he said, Amen. I gave an altar call. He didn't know when he came out. Surrendered his life to the Lord. But he didn't understand uh, the details, the depth of what had happened. And then, when we finished, he said, My tiger, my tiger, my tiger, where are you? Tiger had gone. That's the key. I give unto you, Jesus Christ. It's not an Egyptian taskmaster who will tell you to go and make bricks without giving you the straw. He is not going to send you to a difficult place. Go and build the church in partnership with me. And he will not give you the wherewithal, the instrument, and the tool by which you are going to get the work done. Partnership with him. And power from him. So that we can build the church together. If you have not got the key, you'll get it before you go. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever, whatsoever, why are we wasting time going to learn about the names of the spirits under the ground? Why are we wasting time, precious time, interviewing people? What was the religion of your father, of your grandfather, of your grandmother? And what was the major thing? Was your great grandfather herbalist? And was there something they buried inside your house? Or are you wasting time? Whatsoever, whether it's territorial or it is uh, from the forest or it's from the sea or it's mummy water spirit or it is whatever, whatsoever. And what did you find out in the New Testament? All this long interview, your background, your father, your mother, your grandfather, and this one, and this one, and digging this up and digging that one up. Church, they've spoiled everything in the name of deliverance ministry. And they have abandoned the Bible. They have abandoned the word of God. And it's like now we're, we're asking, you know, we come to where, where they buried Jesus. And we think he's still there. And we're asking the gardeners who are asking, where did they take my Lord? And we're asking all these churches, where, did, where has they taken faith? Where have they taken faith? And the power of prayer. And the authority of the name of Jesus. And the power of the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Ghost. Where have they taken the effectiveness of the two-edged sword? And they have to be doing all these all these little, little things. Wasting time and thinking that they're doing ministry. But from today, the Lord is giving you the key. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
who were, were ambassadors of Christ, were co-laborers with him, were the feet and the hands and the, and the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, were members of his body and were walking together in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading there from verse 4. For we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Have been then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. Whether prophecy, let's prophesy, proclaim according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wage on a ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. It's just telling you there, we're members of his body. And as members of his body, we're, we're doing the work together. Of course, I'm sure you know that Christ could build the church without any of us. Without me, without you. But we can do nothing without him. Whatsoever we have, and whosoever we are, we are nothing. We are valueless without him. Hey, don't let any of us ever get so proud. See what I've done. See what I accomplished. See the thing I raised up. Whatever you are, whatever you have, whatever you possess, is it not because you are in partnership with him? Without me, he said, you can do nothing. And even the greatest of all apostles said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. That grace to labor, that he mentioned, that includes the gifts. Because it says, unto every one of us is given grace, mentions grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. When Paul the Apostle said, it's not me, it's the grace of God that has given to me, that includes the gifts for ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 7, Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What are the gifts? Verse 11. He gave some apostles. You don't claim apostleship. I claim it. I'm not an apostle. You cannot claim it. He gave some apostles. Some prophets. That's what I want to be. I claim it. You cannot claim it. He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelists. I read about those evangelists and I see their names in the papers and I see them attracting crowds and everybody is talking about them. And whatsoever I say, that's what I will have. I say it, I have it. No, it is not part of that. He gave some evangelists. And some pastors, he gave. That's his gift. He gave it out. And teachers, why? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come. Into the very essential welcome to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you see the purpose there where we're in ministry. But the point is, He is the one that gives us the power, the ability to do what needs to be done. And the Lord will give you all that you need. He gives sufficient power. He gives abundant grace. He gives appropriate gifts to fulfill the ministry that he has called us to. He has not asked us to go and open the door of the kingdom for sinners to come in without giving us the key with which to open that door. 
I want you hurt. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then the apostles, when they were explaining how the Lord was mightily using them, did you hear what they said? They said, we are his witnesses. How is it? Through the power of the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. And then Peter was very quick to say, according as his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And that's why we, we don't have to. We don't have to copy anybody. If the Lord has really called you to a ministry, he'll give you all things pertaining to life and godliness. I don't have to go and take it's something that Reverend so-and-so, Bishop so-and-so, Archbishop so-and-so, Apostle so-and-so, there are many names nowadays. I don't have to go and take whatever they have done. And then I say, okay, this is the kind of message, and this is the kind of procedure that actually gets the work done. That's why the church is, you know, like that. And then come cram it in my head as if I'm a secondary school boy. And then pour it out after cramming it. I don't have to do that. He, the one who, is, who has sent us, he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So that by these precious promises, we'll be partakers of his divine nature. If we appropriate all that Christ has given us, then we can each say with assurance, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You can do all things. I said you can do all things. All things he wants you to do, all things he appoints for you to do in partnership with Christ and with power from Christ, you'll be able to fulfill the ministry that you have received from him. Point number three. Protection and preservation of Christ's church. The building. Come back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Then in verse 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Here is the protection. Here is the preservation. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. Sometimes when we forget the promise of Christ, the plan of Christ, the purpose of Christ, the power of Christ, the proclamation of Christ, when we forget, then there's a little problem in your little church there. But it's a true church. It's a real church. You have people there that are born again. They are called out of the world. And they have the mark of Christ on them. But when you forget all this plan of the Lord. And the purpose and the power of the Lord. And then you become afraid. They will scatter this church. They will destroy this church. It's like not my life is on the line. I've wasted my time. Because see, see all that is happening. And see all the threats of the people. And they have even written a letter. They have said, well, we'll finish that church. Tell them they cannot. I've not discovered yet. I've not found out yet. Anyone, human or spirit, that is powerful enough to tell the Lord and confront the Lord and say, he is going to make sure that the true church of the living God swallow anything you want to swallow. Go to any confederacy you want to get to. Upon this rock, I build my church. If it's the church of man, it will collapse. If it's the church of Christ, the church of the living God, and Jesus Christ paid the price of his blood to erect and to build and to edify that church, no Satan, no spirit, no devil, no demon anywhere can destroy that church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. That's a promise. 
it will be fulfilled. Rest your mind, relax. Nothing can happen to the church of the living God. Let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is coming back? Just, just imagine, just imagine, just for, uh, just for logic, argument, purpose. Just imagine if it were possible that all of us here, ministers, with all our members, just imagine that it were possible for the devil wipe out, to wipe out all of us. Make us backslide. Cancel the church. Just imagine that the devil were powerful enough and that he has powerful enough emissaries. Get to Ghana. Get to the Gambia. Get to Sierra Leone. And get to Liberia. And get to Cote d'Ivoire. And get to Togo. And get to Benin. Wipe out the ministers. Wipe out the church. If it were possible. Who will Christ come back to take to heaven? So Christ will come. And there will be nobody in Nigeria. Nobody in Ghana. Nobody in Ivory Coast. Nobody in Africa. What will become of what the Bible says very clearly that after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude. That's at the consummation of everything. When Satan had done his worst, at the consummation of everything, when the assembly and the confederacy of the witches and the wizards and the evil spirits and the familiar spirits, when they have done everything they could do, at the end of the whole thing, when all the enemies of the church, when they had done everything they could do, look, after these things I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongue, stood before the throne. I will stand there. I will be there. There is no devil in hell. There is no demon out of the pit. There is no witch out of any village. There is no power anywhere. There is no gate of hell that can stop this. I will be there. I'm telling you, I will be there. When the saints go marching in, you will look to your right, you look to your left, you'll find me. I'll be marching in. I'll say I'm more than a conqueror. I made it at last. Satan was not able to shut my mouth. Satan was not able to destroy my church. And the church of the living God, I will look, I will see the members of the choir, I will see my ushers, I'll see my security people, I will see those working in the kitchen, I'll see my members, I'll see the workers who are working together, we'll be watching, we'll be marching on, we'll be marching on. There is no devil there is no devil that can stop me there is no devil that can stop this church there is no devil that can stop the work of god i see them i see them i see them i see them they are marching in they are marching in they are marching in they are marching in i will be there i will be there i will be there no devil can stop you no devil can stop you no demon can stop you because the saints of god the saints of God, the saints of God, they'll be there upon this rock, upon this rock, upon this rock, I will build my church. 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 And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you because you brought us to this very point in this minister's conference of this year. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have taught us on the very beginning. Every message and every seminar, every interaction together, every period of prayer, every time of hearing, every time of calling upon you has been an enriching, beneficial time. You've touched our hearts. You've renewed our vision. You've granted us a new zeal and passion. You've put something within us that will never die in Jesus' name. And you have assured us this morning that you, Christ, you are building your own church. The church of called out people. 
The church of redeemed, purchased, forgiven, cleansed people. And the church of those who are purged, pure, and their lives have been turned around. New creatures in Christ. Lively stones that are building up into a spiritual house. The church of those who are holy and peculiar. And Lord, we pray as you use us as instruments and tools in your hand. We are praying, O oh Lord, the people that really come in through us and through our ministry. They will be real, real, genuine converts of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray, oh Lord, as we speak, representing you. The power that transforms life. You will let it pass through our walls with the power of the Holy Ghost. And these lives, in their thousands and millions, will be changed, transformed, turned around in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray every barrier between us and the people. Between the proclaimed word, the spoken word, and the people. The barrier may be because of culture. Or because of bad habits of the past. Or because of wrong notions concerning religion. Whatever the barrier, Lord, we're praying. You will blow up that barrier in Jesus' name. So that the word you are sending to them through us will reach their heart. Will touch their heart will do a definite work of grace in every heart in Jesus' name. Your ministers are going back to their ministries, to the various local churches where you call them to minister. As they go on the way, Lord, we pray you protect everyone. There will be no bad news. All the news you'll be hearing from them will be good news in Jesus' name. In their families, in their ministries, in their local churches, Lord, we declare every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up in Jesus' name. And the very gates of hell, authority and the forces of hell, and the powers of darkness trying to work against, trying to militate against the work you are doing through them, they will never prevail. They will never prevail. Lord, I pray as your servants are going back, they go back with boldness, with courage, with faith, with conviction that will never be compromised in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that the key you have given them, that key will function and work. When they open, nobody will shut it. When they shut any door, nobody will open it again. Every place the soul of their foot shall stand upon, give it to them in Jesus' name. No man, no woman, witch or wizard, familiar spirit or cultic spirit, no man shall be able to stand before any of them. As a word with Moses, with Joshua, with Elijah, with Elisha, with Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As so are with Paul and John and Peter. As so are with the worthies of old. And you are with them. Oh Lord, I pray. All these ministers that are going out, going back to the field, you will be with them in Jesus' name. Satan will flee before them. Demons will fall before them. Wicked men will flee and flee before them. Lord, these brothers standing, ministers standing, they have yielded themselves to you. All to you they have surrendered. Take what they have given you. You see it in miraculous, mysterious way. Lord, we know that if Jesus tarries and we're given chance to meet again, there will be testimonies. And Lord, should anyone, anyone, any of our ministers say, who have attended this conference, should his work be over before we meet again? Should he lay down the tools before we meet again? We pray, Lord, if he closes up his eyes there, he will open his eyes in glory. 
And then, those who live before us will be waiting for us up there. Until the whole body of members and ministers, victorious people, conquering people, people that the devil cannot overcome, cannot overthrow, until we are complete and we are marching, I pray, Lord, we will not be found wanting in Jesus' name. I pray that nobody will turn back from the battlefield. You put the armor on us, we shall be conquering and go on to conquer in Jesus' name. As we're going, Lord, we pray. And we're going with the persuasion. We're fully persuaded that neither death nor life, principalities or powers, things to come or things that be, shall be able to separate any of these ministers from the love of Christ and from the ministry you have called them to. Confirm your miracle in everyone. Use them like never before. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.